All right, good evening, everyone. Yeah, that's good answering, I love it. Um, thank you all so much for coming out on a Wednesday at five for um, this event. It's really great to see you all here. So um, as many of you know, I'm an, my name is Zoe Strecker and I'm an art professor here at Transylvania. And um, the artist talk today is by Lisa Schlesinger, a playwright. And this is the first uh, event in a series that will go on throughout the year as part of my um, two-year Bingham Young professorship, which is called Crucial Terrain for short. The long title is Crucial Terrain, Ecological Flourishing, Environmental Justice, and Regenerative Culture in the Face of the Climate Crisis. So we have artists, conservation experts, a regenerative agriculture expert, indigenous historian. Um, all of these people will be giving uh, presentations throughout this year, um, usually on Wednesday nights. Um, we also have some, a field trip to remove invasive species from a nature preserve. We have um, an art exhibition in Moreland Gallery and uh, a film discussion and all throughout the year climate change conversations among lots of members of this transit community. So this project is um, vast, I hope, far-reaching and I'm, I'm glad for you all to be here. Um, the next event will be in about a month, October 26th. Greg Abernethy, who's the director of the Kentucky Natural Lands Trust, uh, we'll give a talk called Wild Lands Conservation in Kentucky, Local Action to Address the Biodiversity and Climate Crisis. So that's here on uh, five o'clock again on the 26th. And then following that, November 10th, um, we have a collaboration between several lecture series, including Creative Intelligence and the Del Camp Lecture, and that is um, the U.S. Poet Laureate Ada Lamont. Um, so those are our upcoming events. Um, and this event, though, I've been looking forward to for a very, very long time um, by Lisa Schlesinger. Lisa is a playwright and a professor who co-heads the Iowa Playwright, Playwrights Workshop um, at the University of Iowa. Her plays include Iphigenia Point Blank, The Celestial Bodies Trilogy, The Bones of Danny Winston, Rock Ends Ahead, which was the winner of the BBC International Playwriting Award in the wake of the Graybow Riots and 21 Positions, with Naomi Wallace, who's a Kentucky playwright, um, and Abdel Fattah al -Swar. Um Her playwriting project, Endangered States of America, maps the ruins of ecosystems caused by climate change, neoliberalism, and extreme capitalism on the American landscape. She's also involved with some long-term work in the Slow Theater Project and with the Climate Change Action Theater. Climate Change Theater Action, let me get that right. <laughs> Um, so after her talk, we'll have uh, some time for conversation and Q&A, and um, we'll just keep that as casual and open, so keep your questions in mind while Lisa is talking, and we'll, we'll have a conversation afterward. But for now, please help me uh, welcome Lisa to our campus here at Transylvania. It's all good. Hi. I love it. Thank you so much. I'm so, so glad to be with you today, and I'm so grateful to be with you today. Um, I want to thank Zoe Strecker for having me and for this incredible series. Um, I wish I could be here all semester and all year to hear every one of these speakers, so I'm quite honored and humbled to be here. I'm also um, grateful to Zoe for her incredible work, um, her incredible practice, her art, her environmental justice work, and for her um, influence on my way of seeing ecology in the world. So thank you, and thank you to your university. I also want to say that I'm standing today in solidarity with the women of Iran who are standing up for their, for their bodies and their choice. Um, I will present on two works today, one pre-COVID, um, and one coming through COVID. My friend Kinan Azme, the incredible um, composer and clarinetist from Syria who wrote the music for Iphigenia Point Blank, um, told me that when the Syrian war started, he was in such despair that he couldn't compose or play music for a year. And instead he ran and he ran and he ran, and then one day he realized he's a musician, and his part 
in its journey was to, to compose and to play music. Um, at that time, he was in New York, and he could not go back to Syria. So he was in a form of exile. And I will say that displacement, exile, homelessness, um, immigration has been on my mind for a long time, maybe an obsession. And um, this refugee crisis that I was originally writing about in 2015, you'll see some images shortly. It, in addition to being a global hum humanitarian crisis, is actually an ethical crisis of spirit and conscience. More than 100 million people are displaced at this point. Over half of them are children. Recently, the UNHRC Commission on the Welfare of Children declared that seven million children are deprived of their liberty. Seven million children. Over 400,000 are detained in jail or some form of prison. Since children embody literally the future, what does this mean for our civilization? What will we as a culture do to restore children's rights and to wake ourselves up? That's the question that wakes me up in the morning. Keeps me up at night sometimes. Um, today I will show you two excerpts, as I said, both highly collaborative works between multiple artists. And um, just to say a little bit about my, my background, Zoe gave you some, so I won't say too much, but just to say I was surrounded by art and the theme of justice throughout my childhood. I um, grew up during the Vietnam War my great-grandfather was the president of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, so I heard adults conversing about justice, workers' rights, wages, working hours, fairness. Um, we had music playing all the time, and um, I also drew, I wrote poems, I played in the dirt, I made worlds out of things to work out the collection and connection of problems that bothered me. And I think like art and justice are always intertwined because artists like scientists are always putting things together and making something else. Um, as my friend um, Thuy Le Diem Thuy says, the Vietnamese novelist, she says, we do the work and then the work continues to work. And that's my hope for art um, and for your art. I would like to say. So some of the things I've done in the past are um, all performance oriented and poetry oriented. I think of poetry as an oral form and a literary form married together. Um, I've done site specific large performances, usually having to do either in um, protest of militarization or war. For instance, the, one of the first pieces I did long ago on the eve of the desert storm was um, a whole collective action across the country of the Aristophanes' Lysistrata. I don't know if you know that play, but it's a play where women refuse to have sex with the men um, until they stop fighting. And um, ours was a huge parade that we um, brought through the city and performed throughout the city. And like I said, it went on th through the whole country. People rose up at that, at that moment. Um, Let's see, another one was to um, address occupation, and it wasn't to address a, a war right away, but it was to address occupation in the um, occupied Palestinian territories. And it was called A Dream of the Sea. It was created in partnership with Ashtar Theater from Jerusalem, um, the Every Which Way Festival, um, the International School of the Arts in Palestine, and Bread and Puppet Theater from the US. And the theme of the piece was really about um, university students who could not get to the sea to go swimming, even though the sea was less than 10 miles away because of the situation with the occupation, the checkpoints, the um, military fence, and they're, they're basically the bureaucratic ways that people can prevent other people from moving to new places. 
In this case, people required a permit to go swimming, but they couldn't get these permits. Um, it was a beautiful, huge parade, and it took place basically in the middle of the city, and so that it invited people to disrupt their daily uh, events, shopping or going to school, and to participate and engage with this parade. And it was mostly images of the sea, birds, um, fish, uh, things that could fly, things that could transcend barriers. And then I also write conventional plays, and uh, Zoe mentioned those. And they, to me, they're more about intimacy, like things that happen in the household or in a small community where issues um, of our larger systems affect us at small levels. And so I like to participate in those in small spaces often, like kitchens, um, small theaters, community centers, some usually just outside of the normal theater space. Um, one of the most recent ones was called I, I Dreamed the Last Diamond Darter, about the small diamond darter that um, the last ones are only in the Elk River in West Virginia, and they're um, threatened by the coal, the coal mines and the coal companies. Um, there are also two companies I participate with in, which I'd love to talk with you about if you're interested, and that's the Climate Change Theater Action and Theater Without Borders. In 2014, I started the Ifeyenya Project. It's a multi-year series of collaborations across genres in response to this refugee crisis that we're still in. Basically, that's the most urgent humanitarian crisis we've been in since World War II. And it's seen through the Ifeyenya myth. In this piece, Ifeyenya is excavated like as, an, uh, as a character from archeology, span as a character from classic mythology, from classical literature, and also um, just from like the world. And the idea of excavation, and one of my other obsessions about this displacement is what will the future think looking back at this moment? And I love to project out into the future and ask myself, what will we all look like? What will we ask of ourselves if we could ask ourselves from the future? So in this case, and this is where the inquiry began, is th I was looking at Ifeyenya from the future, which is now, into the past. And I saw her as the first refugee of Western literature, and I'll tell you why. The synopsis of Euripides plays from where she comes, although she's also a mythological character. Um, in the play Iphigenia at Aulis, um, her father, Agamemnon, sacrifices her so that the winds will blow and he will win the war at Troy. Um, she's pretty much told, come to, come to the sea and we're going to marry you to this beautiful Achilles. And, um, but it's only a lure. And then her father sacrifices her. The winds blow. They go off to Troy and when, if you read the Iliad and the Odyssey, you know, they win that war, win, if that's possible. And um, the thing is, though, that like some other Greek characters, Iphigenia shows up in another play that takes place after the Trojan War. So it's like, and Euripides wrote both plays. And in that play, she's in a foreign country, surrounded by people who speak a language she doesn't understand. She's treated by, she has by cruel, cruel gods and government, and, um, and she has to survive that fate. So what I saw was, where does she go in the meantime? Where has she been all this time? Has she been in this cruel country where she doesn't understand the language? Has she been traveling? Has she been hidden? Does she disguise herself? That was the question that I asked myself and that I continue to ask myself as I watch what's happening in the world now. So um, I kind of considered this the path of the refugee as someone with no way forward and no way back. According to the Greek, um, the ancient Greeks, being in this state of limbo is a fate worse than death. I think because that kind of banishment is a, almost a form of torture uh, to be treated so badly and to be unwelcome in the world. Um, the play follows Iphigenia, a teenage girl, and other women and children 
through 2,500 years of history of displacement, through contemporary war zones, to interrogate the current refugee crisis and to change the ending of her story for the future. With filmmaker Irina Patkani, we sought to have a conversation between documentary film and performance, um, theatrical, ritual, and poetic theater. And we started um, in 2015 with a site-specific version of this play, Iphigenia Point Blank. At that time, I called it Iphigenia at Lesbos because there was a massive migration of refugees from um, Syri the Syrian war coming from Turkey across to Greece. At that time, there were like 100 boats a day full of people just coming forward and forward. And one of the, um, the, the intentions of the project was to keep these people visible while we were heading into the 2016 elections when we kind of knew there was going to be a new sensationalist news media. So I wondered, how do we keep a lens on all these people? Because the media will not keep a lens on them. Um, so that first iteration was done in the ruins of Lateau on Crete. And um, it was followed by uh, a documentary film, which I'll show you. And it was then followed by poems, essays, lectures, visits in public libraries, um, several performances at different venues, and then culminated in a final performance of Iphigenia Point Blank, a documentary film opera. So it was an experiment in how do forms change in order to keep your eye and your lens on one subject over a period of time to document history in an artistic way. I'll read you the prologue of the play. And again, it's an excavation. This prologue is uh, voiced by the wind who is a narrator. The wind lights a cigarette with a Zippo lighter, windproof. Artifacts flung on shore, a sea scrub toothbrush and a waterlogged passport, a plastic water bottle crushed on stone, an orphan sock and a broken phone, a fake orange life vest buried in the sand. You can read the future in just about anything, tarot cards, coffee grinds, the Wall Street Journal, but how do you read the past? Our girl's diary, one girl's diary of drowned words excavated from the wreckage. All we have are these scraps, but scraps are my favorite way to tell a story. Let me introduce myself. I'm a long-winded messenger, a scrappy storyteller from a faraway time, the wind. How does the war begin? Once upon a time, everyone knew this story, but now, unless it's on YouTube, it'll probably elude you. Here's the headline. These lands, this world is cursed. You can't go home when home is not home any longer. You can blame it on the gods, or you can say it's another pumped up leader and his greed and his pride. Of course there's, of course there's backstory from way back before the Iliad even, Paris, a boy toy from Troy, runs off with Helen, the trophy wife of the king. It might start in love, but it ends in bloodlust. The king calls his brother, General Agamemnon, and thousands of troops deploy to Troy to capture her and bring Helen home. Overkill much? You know the story. Thousands of soldiers are pumped on shore, armed for Operation Trojan War but there's no wind to sail their ships, all fixed up and nowhere to go. There's an oracle for General Agamemnon, sacrifice your daughter, Iphigenia. Only then the winds will blow these ships to Troy, kill your daughter and win this war. Get her done. At this point, a chorus of soldiers breaks in, and says we love our ships, our pack mules, our rucksacks, our AH-6 little mules, little birds, our S-70 Blackhawks and PC Orions. And the wind says, the general tricks his daughter, Iphigenia, into coming to Aulis with a promise that she will marry Achilles, the kind of guy played by Brad Pitt. And this is the beginning of a 10-year war. 
the destruction of Troy and the slaughter of all its people. Sounds familiar? Some people call it vengeance. Some call it the war on terror. There's all kinds of names for whoring and drilling. I won't be crude. How does this war begin? The deal is everyone wants something. In the Trojan War, they called it Helen. These days, it's hard, cold winter take all. Which lie begins this endless war? Once there was the Paris Peace Pact. There are so many lies, it's hard to know. Which war, you say? Which war are you talking about? Yeah, right, you can argue with us later at the bar. Here's my oracle. Don't fuck with the gods. It only takes one to curse the world, and their timing is not human. The ship might not hit the fan right away, but it always does. And when it's your shit, you will know it. There are, these are our holy waters. There are gods in there. And here in our fields, here where we throw the seeds down and things miraculously grow, why don't you honor these fields? Why don't you honor our holy waters? I'm the wind. I've seen it all. Every day for millennia. I try to stick to the truth. Otherwise, how could I tell you this story? That's the prologue. And I cancel this. <laughs> um, the first iteration of this collaboration was a documentary film about the boats arriving in Lesbos in 2015. Here it is. Ayo, 
this was the first collaboration, and um, from here, the collaboration over a couple of years um, moved from documentary film to documentary opera theater. That's a new thing that we made up as we went along. And although theater doesn't show very well on film, I'll give you this sampler just to have a taste of how the forms meet. time everyone knew this story but now unless it's on YouTube it would probably elude you here's the headline these lands this world's curse if you can't go home when home isn't home any longer is it worth it to name names when the guilty just walk away how does the war start don't fuck with the gods it only takes one to curse the world in our house, the shit went down as they say in the family blood. Some call it vengeance, others the war on terror. We are stud, missiles are ships, cleans up our battles, rain up our city, our shit, six aerial bombs are our stuff. Give a hell is war! Let's get this place started! must make a sacrifice here in Alice. Good morning, soldiers! Good morning, sir! There's no need for enhanced interrogation. I can get whatever I want with a pack of cigarettes and a couple of beers. Our intention is clear. We're going to war! We need this fucker to blow. city cursed you, poor girl. Me? And the sacrifice <laughs> is your life. My life? Two lives, sir! It was an oracle. Father, no! The press backed it up! Hoorah! Hoorah!
They asked me to toast the bride. As mother of the bride, I was honored and outraged. Why am I remembered more murderous and murdered than anything else I did in my life? Why not remember me by the other thing I did? Make these lovely children in the first place. My precious girl. My precocious boy. You know, isn't that something? Making children? Isn't that a woman's first and strongest act of resistance? The loudest political action in the whole goddamn world to make life? survive, you say to yourself. They disappear you, but you will be seen. They silence you, but you will be heard. Even if it costs you your life, sometimes life is what life costs. In Euripides, you leave all the others behind and a sea of blood in your wake, and yet it's a comedy because you go home. You will need to plan it exactly. exactly. You, you will need, need money. money. 2,000 2, euros, euros to cross the sea. You, you will need a bottle of water and a change of underwear. underwear. You, you want, want to live, you, you need, need a, a boat. Shit, 
This work is meant, was meant to premiere in New York in November of 2020, but it was postponed due to COVID. And it will be premiering in New York in 2023 to commemorate the beginning of the Iraq War. That was a lot. <laughs> um, the newest work that I'm working on, I'm, I think I'm going to abbreviate this because I would like your questions. Um, the work I'm em embarking on with um, Leal Shocker, who is the violinist and Iphigenia, um, is called Ruinous Gods, and it's about um, displaced children who have resignation syndrome. That is that it, during the course of being displaced, the stress levels are, they believe, so high that children fall asleep. And um, it was first noticed or uh, diagnosed, it's not a real diagnosis quite yet, in 2005 in Sweden, and it's since been identified in other camps around the world. Um, I think what I will do is I will read you the opening invocation um, while I play the opening invocation. And then we'll have questions. We sing to you in rain across mountains, railway station platforms, train wheels turning, leaving people behind again. You don't even know who we are. You never saw us go. The names of animals extinct and endangered, how will we remember you in a teaspoon of honey made in the lifespan of a bee? On small boats, dinghies with broken engines drifting to reach you, impossibly full of people calling out back where they came from, waves slapping the empty vessels back where they came from, skies full of insects and then gone, all these songs of displaced people and gone, snowy owls, condors, great coral sows, and gone. We sing to you to hear you sing, with you or without your papers, your birth certificates and government IDs. We welcome you, beloveds. And I would just like to say that um, I've recently been reading Joanna Macy, the activist, environmentalist, translator, poet, again, at more um, merging of science and arts. And she says that we're in the great turning. We're in the period of the great turning, um, a name for the shift from the industrial growth paradigm into a life-sustaining civilization. She says that there are three actions we can take, um, and, and th this is the work to be done coming up. She calls them, number one, holding actions. These are things we usually do 
of what we call normal activism, protests, ways of stopping things that need to be stopped. Number two is structural change. These involve societal changing, actively changing societal, societal systems and forms to find new economies and new ways of being together and organizing ourselves in collectives and so on. And the third is a shift in consciousness. And here she says, we all need to do the inner work, the psychological and spiritual transformation um, to meet these actions. My question for all of us is what, does, what part does art play in these actions and shifts and transformations? I personally believe that it widens our choices, deepens our creativity, and offers possibilities for enacting and creating a new kind of future. Thank you all. And I would love your questions and your thoughts, conversations. I'll just come back here so you can hear me. Um, I, I think what's important is to follow your calling and your vision, and it's hard in theater. It's been hard. Well, let me, let me re rewind. I think it's so important to recognize that we've, we're coming through COVID and that theater has an opportunity to be a completely different thing coming through. So we have come from a kind of American theater that's situated in the living room often with a couch, a family has a secret, um, or a city has a secret and we work it out. It's part of our 20th century psychology that we haven't really been able to leave behind in the 21st century. So what I would say is really listen to your inner voice and if it sounds strange, that's okay. You'll find your collective, people who are really excited about taking a different turn and making theater in a different space. Consider theater a form of all the things that it's been throughout history, like a gathering, a dinner, a meeting in the village square, a ritual, a calling out, uh, working through psychologically a transformative experience, a celebration, a performance, a parade, and then just go wild and and go towards the thing you really want to do instead of trying to fit in with what people are asking in old forms. That's what I would, does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yes, please. Well, some of them signed on because they wanted to try singing and dancing and um, really collaborating, not knowing what it was going to be like. Because when you put all those elements together, it really makes a crazy rehearsal process. Um, so we would have singing rehearsals, we'd have dancing rehearsals, we'd have blocking rehearsals. I don't know, you know, some actors won't want to go in that direction and some actors will be really thrilled to go in that direction. Again, I think we're in a really new time, so maybe we could just start in a circle, reading the work and being embodying the text and or singing the work and embodying the text. Like I said, I, I think not everyone's gonna sign up to do a different thing, but um, some people will. all speculation. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Yeah. 
Thank you. Yes, please. That's right. Um, so around the world, we're seeing a rise in anti-immigrant sentiment, and in Europe especially, that's due to the influx of refugees from crisis, um, conflict in the Middle East. So is there anything that gives you hope that that trend is going to reverse? On the bright side, we have seen it reverse, because we've seen an incredible welcoming of the people of Ukraine. So, maybe we need to ask ourselves, why are we welcoming with some populations and not welcoming with some populations and how we can change our hospitality, our, our, our perspective, again, and that's like, I'm not sure politicians can answer that question, but artists, I think, can actually. I know that did not answer your question, but that's for right now my, my thought. And I would ask everyone that as well. Do you have other questions? Thank you very much. I actually have a lot of questions, but I'm going to ask you one. Um, so it's a question about the, your sense of responsibility to the, to the refugees who were filmed coming off the boats. So one way to, to, feel, to feel accountable, not really responsibility, but accountability to their story is you're shining a light on their story in a number of different ways that are very compelling. Um, are there other ways in which you hold yourself accountable to them and their stories? Like, for instance, does anyone know where they are now? Is there any way to share your art with them, or is that completely impossible? But really, it's a question about holding yourself accountable to people's stories. Um, that is such a great question. And, um, that's a question that we ask ourselves all the way through, and it's interesting to revisit it now because it's 2022, and that was first filmed 20 October 2015. Um, we have been able to follow through with a couple of people that we met um, during that time, but obviously not with everyone. And seriously, like one of the biggest questions we had about going ahead with the project was when um, Kinan Azme who was from Syria, the composer, asked us exactly the same question. And the way he asked it was, um, can we scan all of this film? Because I may know some of these people. And how can I do this? And ultimately, lots of arguments and conversations about accountability and what we do. And there are small things like relationships that we built with people where we can help them or we can support them or we can help them find refuge or um, asylum. And then there are other situations where we can be work with organizations that support refugees and support people um, wherever they are, you know, and there are good, there are very good, strong organizations, but I'll also say that there are s some organizations and that are, well, they come in all forms. So how do I, hold myself accountable, I kind of keep working. And I ask myself the questions and I have conversations with my friends who are from the countries I work in and, I, and we ask each other, are we, are we doing enough or should we do more or what, what else should we do? And try to teach people about it. You know, there's all 
different small, very small accountabilities, um, including housing people, um, like I said, supporting people, and knowing that it's a slight accountability. Thanks for the question, and also I'll continue to think about that. And I, you know, I, um, I also think asking ourselves, like asking myself how easy it is to rehouse a family from Ukraine at this moment versus how easy it is it to rehouse a family from Lebanon at this moment or from Afghanistan. Those are questions that we can ask ourselves and talk about in our communities so that we can open up the conversation, but the accountability is very small. Thank you. Oh yeah, did you, did that answer your question? Other questions? Do you ever encounter drama therapy in your work? Yes. Um, two companies I work with, one Ashtar Theater in Jerusalem, they also work in, um, in Ramallah and Gaza, and they do a lot of, they wouldn't call it drama therapy, but they call it like therapeutic drama. And mostly that has to do with um, telling stories and getting stories out into the world. Um, I suppose, and that's a kind of maybe form of accountability is being present for people's stories and, and sharing them with other people when before they felt unheard or unseen. I don't, I don't know. I'm going to come back to that um, continually. Um, the theater company that Leal and I are working uh, um, with in Beirut in Lebanon, They're, they work a lot in the camps and do a lot of what they call psychological therapy or um, psychological dramatic therapy. And they're trained in a, maybe a little bit different system than we are trained. Um, I'm also familiar with um, Basil von, what's his name? Von, um, the book, um, The Body Keeps the Score. And in that book, he talks about um, using drama as a form of therapy at the back, and it's really interesting. I haven't used it myself except when I've worked with experts because I would, and again, like around accountability, I would never um, presume to do that. But I will say that I do really believe in helping people share their stories out and helping people know that their voice matters and that their voice can be heard in other places because young people, especially in places like Gaza and um, in the camps in Greece and so on, are are hope to be heard, want to be heard, and want to connect with other people. Um, do you have a response? Do you know about drama therapy? I, I am in no way an expert, but a, a passionate, long-time hobbyist, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Um, if you have quite, oh, one more, last one. While we're exchanging mics, I'll say that if you have a private question and you want to ask me after, I am welcome the conversation. How do you prioritize your mental health and take care of yourself while working with such big issues? I sleep. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really serious. Like, I sleep because I need to process a lot in my sleep. And um, I eat well. And it's the people. Um, being in the collective with people who are working with you on subjects is really 
a form of care. So me, ha having that meeting of minds and hearts and souls and the whole thing about art and anyone who's in theater here knows how amazing it is when you're doing a project, you're in process and you are just in love with everybody. So generating that love in the process is really amazing and things go wrong and they go you know, wild, but that love is like very central. And so I can, and I also think you learn project by project what the care is. So like right now working with Leal, we meet um, right now once a week at least and, we, and just having that connection with her is amazing. And then we meet with a company in Beirut like once a month and having that amazing connection with them is just really fulfilling. Like knowing, making that connection across the world and knowing that we're working together towards something and that we're gonna start um, expanding the circle is, is a form of care. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much for being here and for your presence and attention. And again, thank you to the tech people, um, camera person, um, and to Zoe and to the university for this series. Thank you so much.